The Nile flowed freely here. It was the source of life for small bands of wanderers who lived along these fertile banks. Fish and fowl were abundant, and there were crocodiles and hippopotamuses to hunt. Each spring, the river would flood, depositing a layer of rich, dark mud from which wild barley grew. These prehistoric people of the Nile harvested their bounty with stone blades and arrowheads. Life here was so dependent on the river that the Greek historian Herodotus would later call Egypt the gift of the Nile and the temple of the world. Scratch upon a rock on these cliffs or deserts of the Nile Valley and the mark is left forever. Into this land, 3,000 years before Christ, would be the central figures of ancient Egyptian civilization, the pharaohs. From the beginning, the land along the Nile was divided naturally into two regions, the narrow river valley that extended northward from the African continent was called Upper Egypt. The lush delta region where the branches of the Nile empty into the Mediterranean Sea was called Lower Egypt. Joined together, this would become the Egypt of history. In this narrow valley, the monuments were built, the inscriptions written, and a mysterious religion and philosophy developed. This valley of the Nile, protected by the deserts which close it in, is the land of the pharaohs. The word pharaoh means simply great house, and it was the mission of the pharaohs to establish their spiritual and political supremacy over all that lived in the land. The foremost symbol of this kingship was the crown. One of the two most important was the white crown a tall, slender headdress with a rounded top. It signified its wearer as the ruler of Upper Egypt. The red crown signified the ruler of Lower Egypt. When the two were combined and worn at once, the crown signified the pharaoh of all Egypt. The pharaoh also carried ceremonial tools called the crook and the flail. It is believed that the crook was shaped after a shepherd's staff and characterized the pharaoh as a shepherd of his people. The flail was symbolic of both a weapon and a tool for threshing wheat. When crossed across the pharaoh's chest, they signified his power to lead, protect, and provide for his people. Nearly every aspect of ancient Egyptian life was believed to be controlled by gods, Often the god was represented by an animal, a reflection of the awe with which these Nile dwellers regarded the creatures that shared their fertile homeland. The ruling pharaoh was believed to be the embodiment of the hawk-headed god, Horus, ruler of the sky and lord of heaven. Above all, the ancient Egyptians believed their life on earth and the order of the universe was controlled by a force they called Ma'at. Pharaoh's job description might be described as maintaining Ma'at. Everything must function according to Ma'at or the universe, the ordered universe, might collapse into chaos. Egyptian civilization began when Upper and Lower Egypt were brought together under one warrior king in the year 3150 BC. He is believed to have conquered his enemy in a fertile field of papyrus to become the first pharaoh of Egypt. The physical evidence for this comes from Upper Egypt in the city of Heraconopolis along the west bank of the Nile. Excavations have revealed a monumental piece of dark green slate, the Narmer Palette. It is the earliest historical record of Egypt and was carved 3,000 years before Christ. 
This is a replica of the Narmer palette, uh, about third scale, so the original uh, would have been much larger than this. The classical interpretation of the Narmer palette has been that this pharaoh, Narmer, um, was the king who unified the country. And uh, this document has really uh, played a major role in that interpretation. Hieroglyphs of the pharaoh's name depict a catfish above a chisel and form the word Narmer, a name that translates literally as angry catfish. This may sound to us rather amusing. However, the Nile has several species of electrically charged catfish that are capable in, of inflicting a very painful uh, electrical jolt. Uh, so that I think the uh, name really has some resonance. According to legend, Narmer burned the enemy village and killed each of its soldiers. The reverse side of the Narmer palette depicts such a scene after the pharaoh's battle. In front of the, the king and the followers of Horus is the remains of a battlefield with rows of beheaded individuals with their heads between their legs. Narmer began a bloodline that marked the rise of the first dynasty of pharaohs over 5,000 years ago. 29 such dynasties, or distinct family lines of rulers, would follow. The changes due to either lack of an heir or by the wars and political infighting that lay in the future of the pharaohs, a period that would span some three millennia. In order to secure his conquest, the pharaoh Narmer probably married a princess of northern origin. He then moved north along the Nile and founded his residence city at a site known as White Walls. Here, in 3050 BC, he was succeeded to the throne by his son, whose name found on a simple shard of pottery meant fighting hawk. He was the pharaoh Hor Aha. Hor Aha's greatest achievement was the founding of the city of Memphis on the site of what had been his father's residence, White Walls. This city would grow into the political and religious capital of ancient Egypt. Made of mud and wood, it is all but vanished. But the Greek historian Manetho leaves an impression of this city of white walls. Memphis was by far the largest city I had ever seen. A colossal wall of pearly limestone encloses the city proper. Within the wall, many temples rise from the enormous spread of brown brick houses, and around them tower an army of gigantic statues. The pharaoh and his family lived in a palace inside the great white wall. The interior was brightly painted with scenes of Egyptian life. The wood beam ceilings were supported by massive columns of stone. The pharaoh's mourning began with a ritual bath that was witnessed by members of his court and his attendants. Because he was required to appear before his people dressed as a god, hygiene and appearance consumed a great deal of King Horaha's time. During this period in Memphis, the hippopotamus was a prevailing symbol in Egyptian culture. Hunting them, in fact, was considered a great sport of the nobles and pharaohs like Horaha, who pursued them in the marshes along the swamps at the edge of the Nile. It was on such a hunt that Egypt would see its pharaoh, Horaha, killed at the age of 62. According to the legend told by an ancient priest, Horaha was carried away from his people in the jaws of a hippopotamus. But did the pharaoh Horaha really die this way? The hippopotamus also has a religious implication because the male hippopotamus was the embodiment of the god of evil called Seth or Set, S-E-T-H. And one wonders with this story preserved by a priest whether it's a reflection somehow of the king being carried away by the embodiment of evil. Perhaps the 62-year-old pharaoh really was carried away by old age, and the ancients attributed his death to their god Seth, the bringer of fierce storms of the desert, 
whom the Egyptians sought to appease. We may never know how the pharaoh Huraha really died, but we can visit his tomb in search of clues at an ancient burial ground on the edge of the desert. The city of Abydos was begun as a burial site by the earliest pharaohs to honor the god Osiris, Lord of the Dead. It was the legendary rebirth of his body that gave rise to the ancient Egyptian belief in life after death. Forty feet below the desert surface is what remains of the Osirion, the temple at Abydos where the ancient Egyptians worshipped the god Osiris as a symbol of resurrection. Its walls are inscribed with chapters from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, a set of instructions designed to enable the deceased to safely pass through to the next world. Until now, most bodies had been simply buried in a shallow pit. The natural drying effects of the desert sand against the corpse resulted in a withered human form in a very short time. To shield their earthly remains for all eternity, the pharaohs of the first dynasty built sturdy tombs here. Once buried at Abydos, the pharaohs believed they would join their god in the afterlife and indeed continue to rule and keep order in the universe forever. The tomb that awaited the pharaoh at Abydos was called Amastaba, the Egyptian word for bench, made to endure forever. The mastaba was built of sun-baked mud bricks with a flat roof and sloping sides. Inside were compartments stocked with an array of food, tools, and furniture intended to fortify the king for eternity. Under this structure was a shaft that led to an underground chamber lined with brick. There the pharaoh's body would rest and the shaft would be filled with stone to make the tomb inaccessible. Most scholars agree that the ruins of this tomb, which archaeologists call Tomb B-19, once held the remains of the pharaoh Horaha. Around him were the burial pits of his faithful servants, concubines, and even pet dogs, who were all sacrificed and expected to accompany him into the afterlife. In time, such sacrifices ceased and burial near the pharaoh was reserved for royal family and valued subjects. Another tomb close by was labeled with the name Bernerib, which translates literally to sweet heart. It is possible that this was the tomb of Horaha's queen or possibly his favorite concubine. The death of the pharaoh Huraha marked the start of a period of growth and prosperity for Egyptian civilization that would last for more than 800 years. Memphis was the hub of culture and trade. Workers unloaded cargoes of livestock and vegetables that came from Upper Egypt. Gold, ivory, and precious stones were brought up from Nubia in the south. The Egyptians preserved some scenes of this ancient life in wooden models. From these, we know that barley was ground and kneaded into dough for large quantities of bread. Cows were slaughtered for meat, the preferred food of the noble class. A powerful country needed administration. These tasks fell to a special class of ancient Egyptian, the scribes. The scribes are very important because uh, they really represent the official class, the, the, the bureaucrats who make up the government, uh, who really made Egyptian culture possible. The pharaoh was the leader, but without the bureaucratic structure to, to fulfill what he thinks is needed, uh, the Egyptians couldn't have achieved what they had to achieve. But it's important to remember that only maybe 5% of the Egyptian population at any time were actually literate. As a practical matter, the pharaoh had to delegate most of his duties to officials called viziers, second only to a pharaoh in status. These Egyptian high officials were schooled as scribes and were often depicted sitting cross-legged 
with their papyrus laid across their lap. This was the customary posture for writing. Not only did the scribe ensure the pharaoh's wishes were carried out, he ensured a record would be left for history. By the end of the Second Dynasty, in 2700 BC, the Wall of Lists of Abydos tells us that 22 pharaohs had reigned over Egypt since Horaha founded Memphis, but little more is known about them beside their names and what they meant. One pharaoh's name would read Hotep Sekemwe, or God of Pleasing Powers. Another was Seth Peribson, which meant simply powerful in heart. What else we know is that their burial mastabas would be built closer to the capital city, Memphis. These grew more imposing and elaborate. Some reached 17 feet high with as many as 70 chambers. The construction of ever more elaborate monuments to these pleasing and powerful pharaohs indicates increasing confidence, wealth, and knowledge. The Egyptians soon developed new skills in building and architecture. A trend towards greater and greater beauty and excellence led here to Saqqara. Located south of the modern city of Cairo, this remarkable stone edifice is the funerary complex of King Djoser, the first pharaoh of the Third Dynasty. With the reign of Djoser, which began in about 2630 BC, the power of the pharaoh was absolute. Everyone from the proudest administrator to the lowliest slave was subject to his dictates. It was Djoser, whose name meant the most sacred one, that first began to explore the vast mineral wealth of the Sinai Peninsula that lay across the Gulf of Suez to the east. Here he would discover rich deposits of copper and turquoise that added to his wealth. He sent boats up the Nile to extend his rule and the borders of Egypt as far south as Aswan. To proclaim his exalted status, Joja commissioned the first pyramid ever built in Egypt, the Step Pyramid. 200 feet high, the towering six-tiered Step Pyramid dominates the horizon and the elaborate burial complex which surrounds it. King Djoser's burial complex is very important because it is the first monumental uh, building built entirely out of stone, the first time in history. Even more important, it gives us the idea of how a funerary complex is going to look like in Egypt from that time on. As a burial monument, it was truly a staircase to heaven. As an architectural achievement, it pays homage to the pharaoh Djoser's mysterious chief architect and scribe, Imhotep. An inscription from his period contained this tribute. Seal bearer of the king of Egypt, one who is near the head of the king, director of the great mansion, royal representative, high priest of Heliopolis, Imhotep, the carpenter and the sculptor. Imhotep, I suppose in a modern idiom, we call him the Leonardo da Vinci of ancient Egypt. He was brilliant. He was everything. He was second only to the king. He was the vizier, the chief statesman. He had many high titles. But who was he? We don't really know. All we know is his status at the time, that he was the, the genius who built the stone pyramid. The tomb Imhotep designed for the pharaoh Djoser took the old mastaba form to new heights. Imhotep actually built six mastabas of diminishing size, one on top of another, by assembling hundreds of thousands of white limestone blocks. The result was a monument to his king that could be seen for miles on the desert horizon. The building of this first pyramid also coincided with Joja's choice of the sun god, Re as the country's dominant deity. To honor Re, the temples adjoining the pyramids would be built with their entrances toward the east to face the rising sun. The 
complex was enclosed by a wall 30 feet high with many false entrances. This served as a symbolic setting for Jozier's Hepsed Festival, a ceremony that celebrated the pharaoh as a magical symbol of fertility. It involved the pharaoh stepping through a ritual course that represented the four corners of Egypt. Inside one of the Step Pyramid's galleries, a relief depicts Jozier eternally stepping through the Hebsed Festival as his court recited a pious incantation. Lord of destiny, creating the plenteous harvest, pillar of the sky, support of the earth, leader who directs the two banks of the Nile. There is plenteous harvest wherever his sandals may be. The Hebsed Festival uh, took place about every 30 years of reign of a particular pharaoh. And it was meant to be a rather civilized um, way of rejuvenating uh, life in Egypt and prosperity and to ensure that they would they would have this in other cultures uh, very often they would kill the king and then there would be a new young king coming onto the throne but the Egyptians did not do that they had a ritual for rejuvenation and the king would stay in power Josia would reign for only 19 years and we may never know whether his Hebsed court was ever used for the festival of his rejuvenation. We do know that when he died in 2649 BC, he had begun a legacy of pyramid building in ancient Egypt that would be copied and refined for 2,000 years. The name Snefru meant bringer of beauty, and his reign over Egypt would last 24 years. Snefru's predecessor, Djoser, had pushed the Egyptian border as far south as Aswan. Now Snefru sought to stretch his influence further, sending a campaign deep into Nubia to settle in the city of Buhen. This was used as a base for mining expeditions, trade, and conquest, he is said to have returned with 7,000 captive Nubians, presumably to use as laborers, and 200,000 head of cattle. This carving celebrates a raid on turquoise mines in the Sinai Peninsula and depicts Snefru killing an enemy. Its inscription calls the pharaoh a great god who conquers the foreign lands. Another of the chief commodities sought by the pharaoh was timber. Much wood was needed to make furniture and provide beams for the homes of the wealthy. But such trees were scarce in Egypt, and the nearest source would require the Egyptians to travel by sea. The pharaoh ordered construction of 60 merchant ships. Soon there were fleets of graceful sailing vessels en route to Byblos in Lebanon. One of Snefru's scribes would record the bringing of 40 ships filled with cedar logs. Wall inscriptions from this time also tell us that Snefru awarded estates built of cedar logs and mud bricks to his high officials. But he was careful that they were widely separated to discourage them from banding together to form their own sub-kingdom. Still, the king found time to celebrate. By all accounts, life was sweet under Snefru's rule. Egypt in the third millennium BC was a land of peace and plenty. Formal gatherings of nobles were hosted by the new pharaoh and his queen. Members of the court feasted on figs and fattened ducks. These people of ancient Memphis were lovers of beauty and fashion. They wore wigs, eye paint, and fine linen robes when they wore much at all. The ancient Egyptians also paid great attention to fragrance because body odor was a sign of sinfulness. For this reason, cones of perfumed fat were worn on the heads of eligible women. Over the course of a long, hot evening, the cones would melt and run down over their bodies. A 
Another sign of the pharaoh's style of rule comes from a papyrus which recounts how aboard King Snefru had himself rowed around a lake by a young beautiful woman wearing only fishnets. Ultimately, the ancient people of Egypt were bound to the past as embodied by the spirit of the departed. For this reason, it was only natural that the enduring symbols of the culture were mansions for the dead, the pyramids. The pharaoh Snefru would move the royal burial ground yet again, not back to Abydos, but to a new site along the Nile called Dashur. It is here that he would build the first true pyramids. For much of this century, this site has been closed to visitors and seen only by a handful of archeologists. Newly opened, the site offers a rare glimpse of Snefru's spectacular constructions as they dominate the desolate, almost lunar horizon here. Rising 341 feet from the desert floor, this is the Bent Pyramid, the first that Snefru would have built for himself. Snefru named it the Gleaming Pyramid of the South, and its shape led some scholars to suggest that the pharaoh died suddenly and his pyramid had to be finished hastily. In truth, the curious shape reveals much about Snefru's pyramid builders. The Bent Pyramid is probably one of the first major lemons that we can uh, find in history. When they st originally started building the pyramid, um, the Egyptian architects didn't realize that the ground on which the pyramid was built could not carry all that weight. So as a result, when they got halfway up, the uh, interior of the pyramid started cracking. Uh, there were all kinds of structural problems. So one of the ways they tried to fix it was to change the angle of the pyramid to a less steep slope so that there would be less mass of rock on it. Inside, Snefru had this limestone relief of himself placed on the wall of a chamber. It depicts him dressed for his renewal or Hebsed festival and wearing the double crown that signifies him as the ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt. Outside his misshaped pyramid, he supervised the building of an elaborate funeral temple, part of which can still be seen. I think the pharaohs kept very close tabs on their monuments, especially their funerary monuments, their pyramids and mortuary temples. And they would probably have been there quite often to see at first hand how things were going, because no matter how powerful the pharaoh was when he was alive, his eternal um, prosperity depended on having the right tomb. And so in a way, for them personally, this was one of the most important events of their reign. And it was very unfortunate if you were a chief architect and something uh, really went wrong, which occasionally did. Such was the final case of Snefru's Bent Pyramid. Its chambers would remain forever empty, but his architects were not punished. Instead, one mile to the north, they went on to build a masterpiece, the most striking edifice at Dashur, the Red Pyramid. Standing 344 feet high, this is the first true smooth-sided pyramid to be built in the world. Its name derives from the rock it was built with. Rich in iron oxide, the stone takes on a reddish cast in the desert sunlight. The design of the Snefru's Red Pyramid closely followed the emergence of the sun god Ray as the country's dominant deity. The pyramid was conceived to resemble a sunburst in stone, its sides reproducing the slant of the sun's rays as they angled toward the earth through a cloud break. The pyramid also represented the pharaoh's divine place in Egyptian society. The king is at the apex, the pharaoh, and it spreads down, widening out. The immediate family are the closest and higher portions until you get right down to the broad base. 
it tells us how unified the kingdom was, how the king, the pharaoh, could call upon forces to build, and people were pleased to work on this because it was a monument to the king when he became a god after he died, and in so doing, it ensured their own well-being on earth. Ironically, the very top or capstone of the Red Pyramid that symbolized Snefru has fallen to the ground where it has been preserved. In a mastaba south of the pyramid were buried Snefru's high priest Rahotep and his wife Norfred. They were represented by painted limestone statues the Egyptians believed that such realistic sculpture would help a spirit to recognize a tomb as its home in the afterlife. Their features offer an exceptional look at how an ancient Egyptian would have appeared. Early explorers were so startled by the lifelike glass eyes of the statues that they dropped their tools and fled. These faces have been locked in a gaze toward the future for 3,000 years. Their solemn expressions have been thought to show their confidence in immortality because they were connected to the pharaoh. The woman Norfred is identified as a princess. In addition to the title of high priest, Rahotep's statue is inscribed, King's Son of His Body. This has led scholars to speculate that this figure may well depict the son of the pharaoh Snefru. Snefru himself was destined to be buried in his masterpiece, the Red Pyramid. Inside, a magnificent hallway passage opens to a burial chamber with ceilings that stretch 45 feet high and appear to be held in place by beams made of stone. Though long ago emptied by tomb robbers, the chamber would have held unimaginable riches and ultimately its royal occupant, the pharaoh's corpse. Here, the dead pharaoh was thought to gaze through the shaft to watch day turn into night. Sealed in a stone tomb, a body would quickly decompose from moisture. The ancient Egyptians realized they were actually destroying what they were hoping to protect. And so, upon Snefru's death, he would become something else. It was during the fourth dynasty in ancient Egypt that the pharaohs undertook the most ambitious building projects ever attempted before now. The first to build here was the pharaoh Khufu, he succeeded his father, Snefru, in the year 2551 BC. Snefru had built the Bent and Red Pyramids at Dashur. Now, Khufu would build on his father's achievements, erecting the largest pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid, inherited an already very stable, centralized, uh, and powerful kingdom. Uh, and although we're very impressed by the Great Pyramid, uh, it's important to remember that his father had already had two pyramids built, also massive monuments in stone, which if you took them together would easily outweigh the scale of the Great Pyramid. So we're very impressed by what Khufu achieved, but in many ways he was just continuing a tradition that was already established before him. Rising some 480 feet high, the Pyramid of Khufu is taller than the Statue of Liberty, St. Peter's Cathedral, or an Apollo spacecraft on its launching pad. In fact, it was the tallest structure on Earth until the Eiffel Tower was built in 1889. It was meant to be seen from everywhere. The site that he chose was very important because it's on a rise. It's a plateau and it's on a rise. And so his monument could be seen um, throughout the whole northern part of the country. So wherever you were, uh, around the capital, you could see the monument that was being built. The Great Pyramid is constructed of individual stones that weigh an average of two and a half tons each. 
The immense structure contains more than 2,300,000 of these stones, all placed in such seemingly perfect order that it is almost impossible not to think that this was somehow the building project of gods. Inside, a chamber known as the Grand Gallery was built near the top. It is a red granite room, the final resting place for the pharaoh. At the far end of the chamber is the red granite sarcophagus of the pharaoh Khufu, for whom the Great Pyramid was built. The term sarcophagus comes to us from the Greek word sarx, which means flesh, and phagin, to eat. Combined together as sarcophagus, this gruesome word describes these ancient stone coffins as flesh-eating boxes. How the Egyptians quarried, shaped, and moved so much stone to the Giza Plateau has baffled scholars for centuries. They had no beasts of burden or wheels strong enough to carry the weight. By this achievement, his pyramid transformed Khufu into the very symbol of absolute rule, and the 5th century Greek historian Herodotus chronicled the pharaoh's extreme cruelty. Khufu drove them into the extremity of misery. For first, he shut up all the temples to debar them from sacrificing in them. And thereafter, he ordered all Egyptians to work for himself. To some was assigned the dragging of great stones from the stone quarries in the Arabian mountains as far as the Nile. The people worked in gangs of 100,000 for each a period of three months. The pyramid itself took 20 years in the building. But to such a pitch of wickedness did Khufu come that when in need of money, he sent his own daughter to take her place in a brothel. Modern day scholars are skeptical that Khufu was truly an evil king. The notion that Khufu was a harsh ruler seems to have originated in a um, text that dates to a much, much later period in which he is seen as sort of a bored or even an indifferent ruler, not to say necessarily harsh. That idea was picked up by the later Greek historians and we are told that he was truly a tyrant. But really, there is no contemporary evidence. In fact, there is little written history at all describing the builder of the Great Pyramid and aside from a granite head thought to depict him, only a tiny statuette of him carved in ivory has survived to the present. Outside his pyramid at Giza, a large burial field was recently excavated that suggests that the bodies buried here were the workers whose back-breaking labor built Khufu's Great Pyramid. Had the workers been slaves, Khufu would not have honored them with burial so close to himself. What is known is that not only had pyramid building practices evolved to a high standard here at the beginning of the fourth dynasty, the practice of embalming had grown into an arcane and mystical art that transformed a corpse into a mummy. Beginning about the time of Khufu's father, Snefru, mummification became essential in Egyptian religion for the dead pharaoh to complete a transformation from earthly ruler to heavenly king. They believed that by preserving the physical body intact, they could preserve the pharaoh's spirit forever. An elaborate ritual of embalming was designed to save the corpse from decomposition and restore its faculties so that it could live in a well-equipped tomb. The preservation of bodies through mummification allows us to gaze upon the faces of pharaohs and others whose bodies were preserved over 4,000 years ago. It also allows us to see firsthand just how mortal the god kings really were. Through medical analysis, modern doctors know that the pharaohs suffered from gallstones, tuberculosis, polio, appendicitis, hernias, club feet, and cholera. 
Outside Khufu's pyramid were found these pits in which mysterious pieces of cedar wood native only to Lebanon were found. Archaeologists were able to remove and then reassemble all the fragments. The result was a 143-foot boat that could actually float upon water. The boat was probably provided by Khufu's successor in 2528 BC. This was his son, Jedefre. It was he who presided over his father's burial at Giza. His name, Jedefre, meant enduring like Ray, a reference to their god of the sun. Jedefre's main significance was that he was the first pharaoh to adopt such a sun name. The pharaoh Jedefre ruled only 10 years before he was succeeded by his brother, Khafre in 2520 BC. Khafre, whose name meant appearing like Ray, the sun god, immediately began construction of the second pyramid here on the Giza Plateau. This pyramid was for himself and built in the shadow of his father's great pyramid. The best evidence points to the fact that this work continued throughout his reign of 30 years. During the reign of Khafra, the Egyptians certainly seem to have been very prosperous, prosperous as they were under his predecessors, although some people have suggested that the drain on the economy and the, the, the national population of building these great pyramids was so huge that impoverishment started to set in at about that time. Indeed, there were signs that Khafre's rise to power marked a turning point for the fourth dynasty, a succession of kings that had begun nearly 600 years before. Still, Khafre built on, adding an elaborate mortuary temple complete with a magnificent, life-size statue of himself protected by the hawk god Horus. But perhaps the foremost symbol of Khafre's reign towers on the eastern base of the Giza Plateau in the shadow of his pyramid, the Great Sphinx. The Egyptians revered these mythical beasts as the guardians of sacred places. Khafre's workers shaped the stone here into a lion and gave it their king's face over 4,500 years ago. This is the oldest known royal portrait in such large scale. Its ears are more than 12 feet tall and its eyes are six feet high. Its body measures 240 feet more than three quarters the length of a football field. Its head rises to 66 feet in height, the equivalent of a six-story building. The name Sphinx, which means strangler, was given by the Greeks when they first encountered this fabulous stone creature. The Sphinx itself may have been formed out of the bedrock that was left in that area when that, uh, that was actually an area of quarrying. And some of the basic stones for the core of the pyramid probably came from that area. In fact, scholars tell us that the Great Sphinx was probably carved out of the stone left over from the Pyramid of Khafre. But its ultimate purpose remains unknown. Still crouching in front of his pyramid complex, alone in the silence of the desert, the stony stare of the Sphinx provides challenges but offers no clear answers. As if to yield a clue, its time-scarred, weather-beaten face looks out upon the plain and fronts the setting sun. History would one day reveal that the sun indeed was setting upon the dynasty of pharaohs that built the pyramids and great Sphinx of Giza. Catfish that are capable in, of inflicting a very painful uh, electrical jolt. Uh, so that I think the uh, name really has some resonance. According to legend, Narmer burned the enemy village and killed each of its soldiers. The reverse side of the Narmer palette depicts such a scene after the pharaoh's battle. In front of the, the king and the followers of Horus is the remains of a battlefield with rows of beheaded individuals with their heads between their legs. 
Narmer began a bloodline that marked the rise of the first dynasty of pharaohs over 5,000 years ago. 29 such dynasties, or distinct family lines of rulers, would follow. The changes due to either lack of an heir or by the wars and political infighting that lay in the future of the pharaohs, a period that would span some three millennia. In order to secure his conquest, the pharaoh Narmer probably married a princess of northern origin. He then moved north along the Nile and founded his residence city at a site known as White Walls. Here, in 3050 BC, he was succeeded to the throne by his son, whose name found on a simple sh The Nile flowed freely here. It was the source of life for small bands of wanderers who lived along these fertile banks. Fish and fowl were abundant, and there were crocodiles and hippopotamuses to hunt. Each spring, the river would flood, depositing a layer of rich, dark mud from which wild barley grew. These prehistoric people of the Nile harvested their bounty with stone blades and arrowheads. Life here was so dependent on the river that the Greek historian Herodotus would later call Egypt the gift of the Nile and the temple of the world. Scratch upon a rock on these cliffs or deserts of the Nile Valley, and the mark is left forever. Into this land, 3,000 years before Christ, would be the central figures of ancient Egyptian civilization, the pharaohs. From the beginning, the land along the Nile was divided naturally into two regions, the narrow river valley that extended northward from the African continent was called Upper Egypt. The lush delta region where the branches of the Nile, the flail was symbolic of both a weapon and a tool for threshing wheat. When crossed across the Pharaoh's chest, they signified his power to lead, protect, and provide for his people. Nearly every aspect of ancient Egyptian life was believed to be controlled by gods. Often the god was represented by an animal, a reflection of the awe with which these Nile dwellers regarded the creatures that shared their fertile homeland. The ruling pharaoh was believed to be the embodiment of the hawk-headed god, Horus, ruler of the sky and lord of heaven. Above all, the ancient Egyptians believed their life on Earth and the order of the universe was controlled by a force they called Ma'at. Pharaoh's job description might be described as maintaining Ma'at. Everything must function according to Ma'at or the universe, the ordered universe, might collapse into chaos. Egypt, while empty into the Mediterranean Sea, was called Lower Egypt. Joined together, this would become the Egypt of history. In this narrow valley, the monuments were built, the inscriptions written, and a mysterious religion and philosophy developed. This valley of the Nile, protected by the deserts which close it in, is the land of the pharaohs. The word pharaoh means simply great house, and it was the mission of the pharaohs to establish their spiritual and political supremacy over all that lived in the land. The foremost symbol of this kingship was the crown. One of the two most important was the white crown, a tall slender headdress with a rounded top. It signified its wearer as the ruler of Upper Egypt, the red crown signified the ruler of Lower Egypt. When the two were combined and worn at once, the crown signified the pharaoh of all Egypt. The pharaoh also carried ceremonial tools called the crook and the flail. It is believed 
that the crook was shaped after a shepherd's staff and characterized the pharaoh as a shepherd of his people. Ancient civilization began when Upper and Lower Egypt were brought together under one warrior king in the year 3150 BC. He is believed to have conquered his enemy in a fertile field of papyrus to become the first pharaoh of Egypt. The physical evidence for this comes from Upper Egypt in the city of Heraconopolis, along the west bank of the Nile. Excavations have revealed a monumental piece of dark green slate, the Narmer palette. It is the earliest historical record of Egypt and was carved 3,000 years before Christ. This is a replica of the Narmer palette, um, about third scale, so the original uh, would have been much larger than this. The classical interpretation of the Narmer palette has been that this pharaoh, Narmer, um, was the king who unified the country. And uh, this document has really uh, played a major role in that interpretation. Hieroglyphs of the pharaoh's name depict a catfish above a chisel and form the word Narmer, a name that translates literally as angry catfish. This may sound to us rather amusing. However, the Nile has several species of electrically charged